Good morning and thank you. I, I know what the, what the agenda says for the topic, but when I was talking to Tyron, I said, I could talk about us breaking into new markets, but do you think it would be interesting to share just some perspectives from the new kid on the block? Because we really have two new kids. Premium Peanut is a new sheller, but Carl Zimmer is new to the industry. <laughs> so, um, so, so he said that would be fine. So I'm gonna share a few thoughts, uh, a few perspectives for, for, for what they're worth from a, from a new sheller, and also from somebody new to the industry. Because literally, July 1st of last year, when I started with Premium Peanut, I, I cannot tell you what a peanut plant looked like. So I've been on, on a pretty steep learning curve here. But, but it's been interesting, it's been fun. Um, as well, so so hopefully you also find um, some of these thoughts interesting. So the first thing, since we are new, I have to take just a few minutes to share a couple thoughts about the company. We are a co-op type shelter. We have over 200 grower owners, and we have seven buying points. And I think one of the things that was done that is unique, and I can't take credit for it, it was done as the company was being set up before I joined was some of were, were excuse me some of the differences some of the things that were done differently with setting up this co-op than, than some of the prior ones one of the drivers for it and you all are seeing this and facing it every day is creating stability in the market creating stability for your farmers for our farmers creating stability for our buying points and so yes we have over 200 grower owners but i think one of the things that's unique is that if they bought shares in the company, if they're an owner, they have to deliver the peanuts. They can't go out and contract others to grow for them. And so I think it really goes back to how do we create stability in at least the supply portion of the market. And I think that's really unique. Because of that, we're also seeing significant investment. You know, we've had a lot of the growers make new investments on their farms. We've had a lot of the buying points make new investments with more to come because they see that stability, they know how many peanuts they're gonna be handling, they know how much farmer stock they're gonna be storing, and I think that stability is enabling better decisions to be made going forward for the future. LMC, who, who you all know, they designed and are building the plant, 200,000 tons rated capacity, believe it will be the largest shelling plant in the world, we know it's the newest, and one of the challenges that was given to LMC was how do we incorporate every best practice that's out there, all of the new advancements in engineering and technology, let's put them into the plant. And so I think we're gonna have a really spectacular plant uh, very, very shortly here. Uh, we also are all Georgia grown, and I think that's something that we're proud of. I believe we're the only sheller who could say that. All of our grower owners are in Georgia, all the peanuts we're handling are Georgia um, grown. We're excited about that. Maybe most exciting is that we have started to shell. And yes, we're going through some, you know, growing pains, as, as, as you would imagine, starting up a brand new plant. But the target date was February 1st, and we started shelling in January of this year. So we're up and running, we're shelling, and we really are glad to be a part of this industry. So a few thoughts, um, j just from my perspective. Peanuts are a commodity. Are they similar to other commodities? And I'll share a story or a little anecdote. I was having a debate with somebody recently trying to tell me I knew nothing about peanuts because I traded copper and aluminum for 14 years. He said it's completely different. I said, all right, let's talk about how it's different. Well, in peanuts, you have the farmer stock price or the loan price, and then you have, a, have, have an option. Well, in copper, you have the price you pay to the mines, and then you have a VAB adder to turn it into something that you're gonna use. What's next? All right. Well, you have the USDA sets this loan price, okay, in copper, you have the LME price. What's next? And I think I share that because I think we all need to recognize that fundamentally peanuts are a commodity. And as a commodity, we have to figure out how to be competitive in a global marketplace trading a commodity. No, you can't go to an LME exchange or a futures market and see what they're trading at, but you know, we have great market intelligence from a lot of our broker friends, they can give us that information. But if peanuts are a commodity, we really have two choices on how to compete. We can compete on price long term, I don't think that's good for any of us. Or we can find ways to differentiate ourselves. And I'm not talking just about a premium peanut, I'm talking about a peanut industry in the US or a global peanut industry. How can we find ways to differentiate ourselves to enable us to compete on a global level. We must do that. And I think one of the challenges we have 
given that it's a commodity, is how do we come, become more efficient in everything that we do? On the farm, at the buying point, at the sheller, at the manufacturer, how do we become more efficient to drive down that cost so that we can compete globally? Why is that important? And I think Anna Palm and, and, and John are both going to address it. Because we are in a global marketplace. We talked a lot yesterday about how many tons of peanuts were going to be grown in the US last year, next year, how many forfeitures we're going to have, how much carryover we're going to have. To a large extent, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we grow 3 million tons of peanuts or 2.5 million tons of peanuts. Right? That 500,000 tons difference to China, it's nothing. So yes, it's important data. Yes, we need to track it. Yes, we need to understand it. But ultimately, if we don't pay attention to what is going on in this global marketplace, it doesn't matter. We need to understand what's happening in China. We need to understand what's happening in Argentina. We need to understand what's happening in South Africa. Because ultimately, that global supply and demand is going to drive this market. The US is an important part of it. And we need to pay attention to it, but we also need to pay attention to the world. And so I would challenge all of us, as we're looking at peanuts, as we're looking at our future, how do we ensure that we don't get too myopic in our focus and just look at the US? Because while it's very important, that is not what is going to drive all of our futures. It's in the farm bill. I have been told this so many times by so many people. And it's not just it's in the farm bill, but I think it's also, well, so-and-so said this, right? Or so-and-so said this, so it must be true. If I've read the farm bill, cover to cover, every word in it, and most of the stuff that I've been told is in the farm bill, guess what? It is not in the farm bill. It may be how USDA chose to interpret the farm bill. It may be how the industry has interpreted the farm bill into best practices or, or, or what we do every day. But ultimately, it goes back to a challenge that I think each one of us has if we're going to move forward and improve as an industry, is that we must ask the questions and we must understand where things come from. It's amazing how one sentence or one paragraph in the farm bill can be turned into huge layers and levels of bureaucracy and regulations. But ultimately, I think each one of us has a challenge to understand if we're doing something as a sheller or a buying point, why are we doing it? And if the answer is it's in the farm bill, let's ask another set of questions. Because as I'm learning, a lot of it's not in the farm bill. One thing, though, that I have been extremely pleased with, I spent 14 years in, in manufacturing copper and aluminum wire and cable. Before that, I made jet engines. And one thing about this industry that I think is, is phenomenal is that, yes, we all compete, but it's a healthy competition. And we want the industry to be successful. And I think that's important for all of us. And I know Darlene's going to talk about some food safety initiatives. That's just one area. As an industry, we can't afford to have food safety issues. And so if we can collaborate and make sure we're all doing the right things, that's a good thing. And I think I've just been very, very pleased at that level of collaboration in the industry on some of those topics that are so vital and so important for all of us. And I think that's, that's something that everyone in this room who's part of the peanut industry can be very, very proud of. So how do we get better? How do we reduce our costs? How do we become more competitive? And I would argue one of the ways we can do it is how do we strengthen those linkages between the various elements in the supply chain? We have growers, we have buying points, we have shellers, we have manufacturers, we have traders, we have brokers. Every, every one of those people form part of this supply chain. And how do we strengthen those linkages to understand what happened to the peanut before we got it and after it leaves us. And that's how we're going to become more competitive. Just a little graphic, right? But if you look around the outside, we have different players in the industry. And if everyone is making decisions based on their individual perspectives, is it truly 
the best decision for the industry? Is it truly going to optimize that supply chain? Is it truly going to allow us to take out costs so that we as a U.S. peanut industry can become more competitive? So I think one of the challenges that we have is how do we move from operating around the perimeter of that graph or of that box to understanding the linkages and what we do to a peanut impacts our customer. What you do impacts your customer. And how do we move to making better decisions for that whole supply chain? I'm new, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm learning, right? But you think about during harvest, I know it was a tough harvest for, for a variety of reasons. But if a farmer, you know, brings in farmer stock with 15% foreign material, and because of that, you're backing up cleaners at the buying point, and the buying points are getting backed up, and then we need relief, and instead of putting foreign material in a, in a warehouse at, you, you know, 3%, we're putting it in at 8%, right? It may be a good decision for the farmer, may be a good decision for the buying point, but now if we just added cost further on in that manufacturing process, that the sheller now has more expense. And I think that's just one example. Another one, okay, during harvest, you stack a, a, a buying point warehouse up to the roof. You need the space. You need to turn the trailers. Okay, that's great, but now you can't fumigate it. So now you have to bail it out, or move the farmer stock. That's added cost. Yes, we got through harvest, but now we just added more cost collectively to all of us. And if we move from thinking about how do we individually become more competitive, to really dealing with the challenge that we all face, that we must be competitive as an industry against China, against Argentina, against South Africa, it's about how do we do things most efficiently at each stage in that process so that we're not adding cost to it. Because if we add cost to it, we are not going to be competitive as an industry. So I think our challenge is how do we find some of those solutions? How do we find areas where we can take out cost where we can work together, where we can make the right decisions to be more competitive for the industry. And I was very pleased to hear T.E. Moy yesterday and, and, and talk about some of the work the federal state's doing. Right? It's another example where there's opportunity. There's many examples. You know, federal state grading is, what is in the farm bill. Some of that is in the farm bill. It's how we value that farmer stock coming in from the farm. But does it really relate to the price that a sheller makes when we're selling the peanut to a manufacturer? In many ways, it doesn't. Now, that's not a federal state's issue. Right? They're doing what the regulations lay out. But ultimately, does it really align the incentives throughout that supply chain so that a farmer is getting paid based on the best practices and based on the true value that that peanut brings, not from USDA, but in the global marketplace? I can't compete in Europe based on what USDA sets as the price. I'm competing in Europe based on what the European market is setting as the price. They don't care about USDA. They don't care about federal state grades to a large extent. And I think that's just one area, how could we work together across that supply chain to really understand what the end market is demanding. I like this quote. At every crossway on the road that leads to the future, each progressive spirit is opposed by a thousand men assigned to guard the past. <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm a progressive spirit, but I'm challenging all of us to be that progressive spirit. And how could we look at what we're doing today and say, what can we do better? How can we do better? And yes, there's going to be a lot of people there who are saying, well, that's the way it's always been done or we must do it because it's in the farm bill, or because so-and-so said it needs to be done, right? Or another person's the expert in the industry on this, and that's what they say. How can each one of us ask the question around understanding what's being done? We need that context, we need that understanding, but then challenge it and say, how can we do it better? What can we do differently? What can we do better? How can we all be that progressive spirit and move this industry forward to enable us to survive, to enable us to compete on a global basis, 
because that's really what we must be doing. So a couple areas where I, I think there may be some opportunity. The first is moving from perception-based decisions to data-based decisions. How do we get data to make our decision? No, just don't trust somebody that's in the farm bill. Show me where the farm bill it is. And then let's challenge Congress and our legislators and our regulators, USDA, FDA, et cetera, on their interpretation of the farm bill. And let's use data to do that. I've been in a lot of discussions, a lot of debates, lots of dialogue, when it's based on perceptions. Well, this is what so-and-so said. This is how it's always been done. This is what USDA does, you know, will do. Well, is that, is that reality? Or are we trying to create our own reality by talking it into existence? Let's get the data. Let's understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. And let's use data to help do that. And I'm not talking just about numbers. I'm an engineer by background. I like numbers. You know, it's good to have numbers. But I'm also talking about just understanding why we're doing things, right? Let's not use perceptions. Let's move to reality. Let's get the data. Let's understand what's driving our decisions. <coughs> to do that, we need some help as an industry, I believe. We need help in information technology with a few small exceptions. And there are some pockets out there that I've seen. But I would argue that information technology or use of systems, use of data tools, they don't exist. They, they really don't. And what does exist is designed to ensure compliance to regulations, not to ensure compliance to reality. Think about that. I think a lot of the systems, the tools, the forms that we have today are designed to ensure compliance to USDA regulations or to Warehouse Act regulations or food safety regulations. And the number of people that I talk to and say, explain this data to me, explain this report to me. They say, well, it's not real. I mean, that doesn't match reality, but that's what USDA requires. Well, that's great. But we don't compete based on USDA. We have to compete based on the global marketplace. And so I think a challenge that we all have is we need much, much better tools, much better IT, much better systems, linking every element of this supply chain together. And those systems need to be based on reality. Yes, we need to comply with regulations, even if we disagree with them. But are you, we should challenge them and try and change them if they don't make sense. But how do we get systems out there and an IT infrastructure out there that links the farmer to the buying point, to the sheller, to the manufacturer, so that we can understand every element of that supply chain and we can understand the reality of it, not just generate reports or data, because that's what the regulations say. I think that is a challenge I would issue to all of us, is how do we move forward and create some new and different technology the federal state once again talked about some one of the projects that they're looking at doing. That's a great start. But once again, that's only for one element of that supply chain. It's how do we better manage those buying points. We need to link it all together. That's how we're going to take out costs. Why do we need to do that? Because it goes back to how do we move from operating and acting independently to being part of this larger supply chain. Yes, what you do on the farm impacts the buying point. Yes, you, what you do at the buying point impacts the sheller. Yes, what we do at the shelling plant impacts our customers. To, all of that together impacts our competitiveness or our lack of competitiveness on the world market. Because as I said, and I'll, I'll keep reinforcing it, I fundamentally believe we are fighting for survival and we are competing not against each other, not against cotton, not against other shellers in the U.S. We are competing on a global basis, and we must do what we can to take out costs, to link together these elements of the supply chain, and to become more competitive, and to become more competitive on a global basis. Because international markets are just so important to us and not just as an outlet. I think historically we viewed some of these international markets as an outlet. 
you know, 2012, we had a lot of peanuts, all right, we can export that. Export's a solution to, to, to a large crop or when we're long on peanuts. Well, the international markets have very long memories. And if we support them this year, and then when peanuts get short, we don't support them the next year, they're not gonna be very willing to engage with us when we come back to them when we have the next long crop. And I think we're seeing some of that now. They remember that in 2012, we were there offering peanuts, and then the market got short, and we didn't offer them again. We raised raise pricing, all right? And now we wanna move some of them again. They have long memories, much longer than we do in the US. And so I think if we're looking at international markets, different, as, as just an outlet for peanuts, we're not gonna succeed long-term. We're not gonna really develop these markets. We're not going to really grow outlets for US grown peanuts. And we must do it. So if you're a farmer, ask the sheller what their strategy is for international markets. If you're a buying point, ask your sheller what their strategy is for international markets. Because if the strategy, I believe, is to use them just as an outlet when we have excess peanuts, we are doing all of ourselves a disservice as an industry. They will remember it. And they have long memories. And I think part of it as well is how do we increase all of our joint knowledge of those markets? You know, we heard it's yesterday that Bravo Tilt was mentioned. That's huge. If Europe really goes forward with those regulations, what does it mean? We can't use one of the, one of the great products that, that's used on, on many, many peanuts. Or we have to segregate it now based on how, what, what was put on the peanut plant in the field. Think about that. If we think segregation is bad based on aflatoxin or, or grading, now we have to understand each wagon, each, each, each truckload, what field it came from, and what the farmer used on that field. So if you're not interested in the work that USTR, the US Trade Representative, is doing, if you're not interested in things like TPP, which I know Patrick's gonna talk about, you should be, we all should be. Because other markets, other countries, use their trade, use their regulations as ways to protect their industries or as ways to ensure that their industries have an advantage. And if we're not proactive in doing that, if we're not proactive at understanding the regulations in Europe, or the regulations in Japan, or what's going on in China, it's gonna hurt us. We need to be engaged. We need to be proactive. And yes, we need to be passionate about the US Farm Bill. We need to be passionate about what Congress is doing regarding that Farm Bill. But I would encourage all of us, how can we be passionate around what's going on in global trade? Because ultimately, the Farm Bill will expire, Congress will turn over, we'll get a new Farm Bill, we can influence it, we can change things in the US. Try dealing with the European Union. Right? I was a part of GE 10 years ago when they tried to acquire Honeywell and it fell apart because of the European Union. The regulators in Europe are very powerful, they're very influential, and they have a long-term strategy. They have a long-term view. Do we understand what that is? And are we encouraging our congressmen, our senators, our U.S. Trade Representative Office to understand what they're doing so that we can put our strategies together on how do we compete on the international basis. Fundamentally, we need to shift our thinking, I believe, from viewing international markets as an outlet to really viewing the U.S. and U.S. grown peanuts as one element of this truly global supply chain. I'm excited to be a part of the industry. Premium Peanuts excited to be a part of the industry. I think it's a great time, right? It's a tough time. But if you can be, if you can succeed and be successful when times are tough, it makes us stronger and it sets us up for the future. And I think that's a challenge that we all have. So thank you for, for welcoming, me, welcoming me. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm excited to be here and we're excited to be a part of this great industry.